Cool. So hopefully you can see my slides now and uh, everyone can hear me. So yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I've really been enjoying these talks so far. There's been a, a lot to, to think about and to ponder. And I think really it's, it's left me with more questions than answers and even made me sort of reconsider my own talk and before I've even given it basically. But what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is, is my approach to to typing and characterizing plasmids and, and how I, I kind of start with plasmid sequences and attempt to, to type plasmid lineages. So for the past three years or so, I've been working on uh, the D Detective Project, which is a UK-China uh, collaboration involving the universities of Birmingham and Cambridge here and three institutes in China in, in three different cities. And we're actually focusing on gram-negative uh, pathogens in ICUs in, in these hospitals. Um, and basically each project has been a deep sampling project, uh, sequencing lots of isolates from ICU patients, staff, uh, hospital environments, and also clinical samples. And my uh, role in the project uh, primarily has been to look at plasmids and other mobile genetic elements that are contributing to carbapenem resistance, uh, but also to antibiotic resistance more generally in these strains, particularly where we see the accumulation of, of drug resistance. So. What I've been really interested in uh, is being able to trace individual plasmid lineages. And so the reasons, I, I think it's all, it's clear now from what we've been hearing the last couple of days, uh, why we'd want to do this. Uh, the first one is by observing a, a discrete plasmid lineage uh, over its evolutionary timeframes, we can actually learn a lot about how plasmids evolve, whether at, you know, the SNP level or at these larger levels where we see deletion events, insertion events, uh, recombination events and what effects those things have on, on plasmids generally. Um, but also I think the, the more we learn about how plasmids evolve and understand the, their evolutionary space, we can uh, start to think about how we can more accurately uh, employ genomic surveillance to tr tracing plasmids as well. And that's of course important in terms of antibiotic resistance. So we've just been hearing about how we should be uh, defining plasmid lineages. And we know that the you know, SNPs can happen, but I think uh, one really important way in which to define lineages is to trace them by their evolutionary events. And so we've seen uh, examples already, um, but like a very crude example here, you can see, for example, a bunch of plasmids coming from a defined known original backbone uh, can be placed into lineages based on uh, acquiring different insertions. And, they can go you know, onward and accumulate many different changes, but each will be different to one another. And we need to be able to determine how to tell them apart because that's important for transmission if we're talking about genomic surveillance, but we also need to know whether uh, you know, their evolution is taking them on, on different trajectories or similar ones and if there's different ways for them to reach the, the same, same place. So again, very, very crude and we've heard examples already, but. If we're talking about a plasmid lineage and, and here it is as a circle, here it is as a line, the kinds of things I'm talking about uh, in terms of tracking um, are of course insertions, which can be quite simple. Um, deletion events, which can make insertions more complicated or more difficult to track. Recombination, which can change parts of either the background or insertions. Uh, and the development of complex resistance regions, which is where I can get really tricky with, with uh, annotating and, and determining how these things have happened. And finally, plasma cointegration, which we've heard a, a little bit about already um, in previous talks uh, in this series, um, but which is, uh, I'm seeing more, much more of it in recent times. Um, so basically, this is a slide I just added because we, we're seeing a couple of different things, I think, I think in, uh, in these sessions. And we either have an approach to typing plasmids where we can start with all of the sequence data available, which uh, I know for me is certainly starting to become overwhelming. Uh, or we can start slowly with a single plasmid in a single study and work our way up. Um, and I think it's very difficult to get to from the top to the bottom or to get from the bottom to the top. And hopefully uh, with more discussion, we can, we can find a way to reconcile those points. But what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is essentially the, the bottom up strategy. So starting with uh, high resolution annotations and trying to bring that to the larger data sets available. And so essentially what a lot of my work comes down to is annotate, compare, repeat. Um, so to give you an idea of what I would do if I, if I had a plasma that I was beginning with and I wanted to annotate it, uh, obviously the first step is to actually work out what is in your plasmid in, in terms of, first of all, backbone and second, uh, mobile genetic elements like IS transposons, uh, et cetera. So really uh, there's no one answer, unfortunately. I, I've yet to see uh, a single simple solution to this. Um, 
I do a lot of comparisons to reference sequences. So if I know generally the type of plasma that I'm working with, I can have a reference backbone, often to a historic plasma that's been sequenced and, and well characterized, especially experimentally, um, and, and have databases of mobile elements as well. But of course, no database uh, is perfect. So first of all, yeah, annotate your, your backbone, annotate your mobile elements, and then try and look at the sequences around mobile elements. So uh, I'm very specific when I'm typing, rather than just looking for the gene of an insertion sequence or a transposon that might be picked up by Crocker or something like that, uh, look for the actual sequence itself um, and really try to define the context of that insertion. So we know that insertions can generate target site duplications. Um, what I've marked on here is where target site duplications are present. Um, the converse to that is if you know a mobile element can generate a target site duplication, but it's not flanked by one, the you know the result of that is probably uh, that you've had a deletion. So for example, here we might be expecting a deletion and you could compare to a backbone sequence to determine whether you're missing something that you think you should have. And so if you do that, you can then work out what's in your backbone, whether certain parts of the backbone are interrupted and you might even be able to predict phenotypes from that in terms of conjugative transfer, uh, et cetera. Um, like this. And also, uh, of course, we, we just heard um, in uh, Will's talk that essentially we can have really rapidly evolving uh, elements or you know combinations of mobile elements in these plasmas as well. And they're also important to, to track as well as just the backbone in these things. Um, it sometimes feels like annotations like this never end. You might find weird sequences in your plasmid that don't seem to match a backbone, don't seem to match a mobile element. And, and that's how you can, of course, discover new elements. And there's always more to discover in, in what we're finding the more that we sequence. So in the end, you yeah, you have to try to be as accurate as, uh, as possible. I try to be in, in my annotations. And the reason for that is because that allows me to do what I'm going to mention next, which is take these really precise sequences uh, at the junctions of elements and backbones or elements and elements if they insert into one another and use those to further characterize other plasmids uh, and to then look in larger databases. So for example, here we have an insertion sequence jumped into a plasmid backbone. This sequence here, which uh, transitions from blue to black, can only have been generated by this precise insertion event. So you will have sequences that have the black sequence and you'll have sequences that have the blue sequence, but you will never have them together in that exact order uh, in any configuration unless this molecular event has occurred. So this precise insertion has occurred. And conversely, you actually have the sequence uh, or you can generate the sequence of what that would look like without the insertion in. So you can also search for the uninterrupted variant. And so if you were to imagine, uh, you know, a, a lineage of plasmids with all of these different events, you could have signature sequences for every molecular event uh, that has occurred in that lineage over time. And you can actually take those very short sequences. So I make them 100 base pairs, so 50 base pairs of element, 50 base pairs of context, uh, and query any set of sequences you like. So you can query complete genomes and plasmids. You can query draft genomes. You may even be able to query metagenomes. I have limited experience in that space, but I've seen a little bit that suggests that uh, it's promising. So the reason, uh, so we've, we've also heard about the difficulties of short read sequence data. The reason I say uh, these can be useful is because in, in my experience of short read sequence data, um, and I've looked at a fair bit, uh, when you have contigs break, you do still get a little piece of the genetic element that causes the break or the repeat that causes the break. Um, and that repeat length is usually 60 to 180 base pairs. So if you use a hundred base pair signature sequence, that is 50 base pairs of element and 50 base pairs of context, that sequence should be preserved in your short read assemblies, which means that even if this is a pile of contigs from short read genomes, you should be able to detect uh, the molecular events that have occurred in your plasma lineage, or at least the derivative sequences of those events. So I'll really quickly try and go through a couple of examples um, where we've, we've used some of this. One example starting from annotating from scratch and learning about a plasmid lineage, and one where we could uh, apply that to a smaller data set and look for plasmid transfer in an ICU. So the first of these are these F233 plasmids, which we've recently published. So I'll be going through this relatively quickly, but um, you can get more detail in the manuscript itself. So the reason we were interested in F233 plasmids is because Zong 
who's a head of infectious disease uh, in his hospital in Chengdu. Um, so a lot of Klebsiella outbreaks that were carrying this type of plasmid with a KPC2 gene. So highly clinically relevant resistance uh, appeared to be in a plasmid. They were seeing it coming back uh, you know, constantly. So they were very interested in this particular type of plasmid. So that prompted our investigation. So Huya and I uh, actually collected F233 plasmids from GenBank and from Zong study. So uh, they're in Sichuan. So actually most of these plasmids here are actually generated by Zong's lab. Um, so we detected F233 plasmids using the REP-A1 gene. And we had a very strict identity threshold of identical. So we, we made sure we were getting exactly this plasmid lineage uh, coming through from our, for our collection here. So 185 plasmids. We saw that they were from multiple provinces in China and they were from multiple niches. So we were seeing them from human clinical isolates, agricultural isolates, um, and various uh, other non-hospital environment isolates as well. And they covered quite a lot of China. But what we actually found is that they're mostly endemic to China. So amongst 185 plasmids, I think there are only five found outside of China at all. So this appears to be an endemic plasmid lineage in China that's really well disseminated, but has not yet really taken the leap uh, internationally, or we didn't think so from, from this data set anyway. So without taking you through the detail, um, basically we annotated all of these 185 plasmids, but we could start by annotating some in more detail than others, then determining junction sequences, searching our database, uh, determining what plasmids look like, and then looking at uh, examples where they weren't matching what we expected them to. And in the end, what we came up with is uh, this plasmid backbone. So this is the F233 plasmid backbone as a black line here. You can see various elements of it annotated. And there were three insertions that were found in greater than 50% of the data set uh, that we could use to characterize the evolution of this lineage. And when you look at it overall, basically there are two massive insertions that account for all of the, the drug resistance genes that we see in these plasmids, and, and there are a lot. Um, but what was also surprising is that insertions in these regions also accounted for a, a massive number of additional plasmid replicons in these plasmids as well. So uh, first of all, uh, I'll just mention this primary resistance region is actually derived from one called TN2670. Uh, which is a very famous uh, old transposon that actually formed in the 1950s and is found in uh, NR1, a plasmid isolated in Japan. So this is actually acquired by the F233 plasmid lineage, not in an insertion event uh, through homologous recombination of its backbone. So a recombination event between blue plasmid and black brought in a little bit of blue sequence and the resistance region that it included. And that has, uh, it made what we called sublineage one of F233 plasmids. Uh, and if you look at all of the sublineage one plasmids, you can see further uh, evolution as well. So acquisition of plasmids and other elements into the primary resistance region and insertions outside of it into the backbone that can also be used to tell things apart. So the second major step was acquisition of a group two intron, which is generally pretty cryptic, but it was very useful for us in terms of determining a difference in these plasmids. And again, if you look at isolates that contain just the PRR and the intron. Uh, you can see uh, various evolutionary events as well, like the acquisition of more plasmids and deletion events in the backbone. And finally, the, the, the really big event, which is what kind of brought this plasmid to our attention, I suppose, was the formation of a cointegrate with an F233 and an R plasmid. And the R plasmid is actually what introduced KPC2 to this plasmid lineage. And what was really interesting to us is that all but one example of these plasmids that had acquired this insertion we found in Klebsiella pneumoniae ST11. And so we also were able to work out that because it had inserted in the tra I gene, which is the relaxase uh, of F-type plasmids, uh, they, this insertion had actually rendered them non-conjugative. And Huya tested this on a number of plasmids and we were able to find some examples in, in the literature as well of non-conjugative co-integrates. And so this led us to believe that this plasmid lineage is actually formed in ST11 and essentially is, is trapped there. And once again, if you look at all of the variants of those, there's massive variation in terms of deletions. So it seems after the co-integration event has rendered the plasmids non-conjugative, they seem to discard their transfer region. And you see big deletion events removing the, the now redundant transfer section of that plasmid. Um, and we even see uh, one weird example 
uh, outside of Globsula pneumoniae, where it's acquired after deletion of most of the R plasmid, acquired an N-type plasmid and a, a small role in circle plasmid, which gives it a couple of extra RETs as well. And that was found in a Proteus mirabilis. So uh, hopefully that sort of uh, rushed tour of these, these plasmids here is, has given you some impression of just how much a single plasmid lineage can evolve over time if you trace it like this. Um, so I don't know how I'm going for time, um, but what I'll also say is that at the end of this, we wanted to uh, look for this uh, plasmid lineage in a much larger data set. So we only looked at 185 plasmids that were complete. Uh, Zong sort of set me the challenge of saying, well, how can you prove that taking these short junction sequences and querying short read genomes and uh, you know, can it actually work? Can you, can you prove to me that it can work? And uh, fortuitously, uh, Grace Blackwell, uh, who, who worked with Zam at the time, had developed a massive and, and really well curated database of bacterial genomes. And she queried them for us uh, using the sequences that we had decided were uh, most useful for identifying these plasmid sublineages. And it worked fantastically. So we could see um, more even than in our original set that we could see plasmids from the F233 lineage have been moving to countries outside of China, although they still are mostly all from China. We see that all of them have the primary resistance region uh, that we expect, which seems to have you know, catapulted these plasmids to success. And we could also see uh, when we sublineage type them as one, two, or three, that as expected, the sublineage three plasmids are all in a really, really tight uh, bunch of Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, consistent with them arising in ST11. And while the rest of them, which we know hop around a lot, are in a really diverse set of host genomes. So this tree is the based on host genome, uh, host chromosome uh, phylogeny. So um, I'm not sure how I'm going for time. Um, Alice, do I have much time left? Um, you're you're basically at time, but the the next thing is is a break. So uh, I think if you could stop in a couple of minutes, that would be perfect. Okay, no worries. So I'll rush through super quickly. So one more example of a, a smaller data data set that we used was actually to look for cryptic transfer in, in an ICU population. And if you've heard me speak before, you may have heard me tell this story. So I can go through it extremely quickly. But just to demonstrate the principle again, uh, in uh, in Hangzhou, we had a collection of ACE native active Almanii, which was all global clone two, but a, an extremely diverse set of global clone two isolates. And we could look at the plasmids in those. Uh, so we actually had to build a database called PACI, which um, if you bring it up in question time, I can tell you how to find it, but really useful for finding plasmids in Acinetobacter. Um, if you look at the distribution of plasmid replicons, they're actually quite blocky and consistent with the phylogeny, except for AC6, which is quite scattered, which to me gave me the sort of hope of, of horizontal transfer in our hospital. So we had a, a short set, a small collection of long read data. Um, so we could look at plasmid, uh, complete plasmid sequences for AC6 plasmids, look at the variation that was popping up in our data set, see a couple of uh, a few different backbones and then amongst one black bone the one in uh, backbone the one in black uh various different insertions and a few snips as well and, and we could make signature sequences of those use those sequences to query all of our genomes without having to long read sequence them all and actually work out what the plasmids were and then split the the messy looking set of ac6 replicons into their definite uh plasmid types so actual plasmids within those lineages and then still see that even when we had a, a more defined set, we could see small plasmids in, uh, so we could see plasmids in multiple clusters, go back to our metadata and thankfully find some cases where we could actually pinpoint the room and time uh, at which these uh, plasmids transferred in our hospital from one cluster to another. So this, this kind of signature approach really helped us pin down some plasmids uh, find them in a really complex data set and with metadata find some really interesting things going on in a hospital environment so yeah in, in conclusion basically we can trace plasmid lineages where we can begin to trace plasmid lineages now but i think what, what we really need is discussion to to reconcile uh, our approaches uh, and sort of come up with a means by which we can uh, you know get all of this much much better you know much more powerful in future i suppose and so just to conclude, uh, thanks to everyone involved with Detective um, and thanks to everyone here, uh, particularly the organizers for giving me the chance to, to speak today and apologies for going over time. Uh, that's it. Thanks Rob, that was super interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna 
actually, I don't think we have questions. For, oh, well, okay, let's give Olivia's question up once. Um, Robert, does the sampling of your plasmid genomes provide any evidence for the evolutionary time scale for the F233 sublineages? Yeah, so I, I guess that's the that's the question we've had uh, across today and yesterday in terms of time scale. I think it's it's so difficult. Um, we're, we're thwarted in many ways by by not having the sampling depth that we need. Um, so we we can tell when an event occurred. We, well, essentially, you can tell that an event occurred prior to when the first example of it was sequenced. So the first F two thirty three plasmid only was was sampled. Actually, came from a dog. Uh, in 2008. So we know that the F233 plasmids had acquired, for example, that primary resistance region in or prior to 2008. And we know that the progenitor of that resistance region had emerged by the 1950s. So we, we can't even roughly tell you when even the first event in that plasmid lineage came, uh, came about. So because we can't even put a start date on it, for most of these events, we can't put a, a you know, any sort of time scale. Um, if you were to really deep sample, for example, a, a hospital environment, you might be able to, to look at, you know, small events, but I think it's just so, so difficult. Um, and, and some of these molecular events, you know, they can happen in an overnight culture in the lab. So they can happen really at any time. It's so hard to, to say. It's not like a, we can't have a molecular clock like we can with SNPs, unfortunately. I think you might be muted. I am muted. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to draw close to um, direct questions for Rob for the moment um, and um, start the uh, discussion session. Um, 